start off with topic two, general physics. Now, the first unit, the heading is length, time, and volume. It's a little bit of measurement, etc. Okay, now, I will show you we have got some calipers and we've got some micrometers, but just for the sake of the recording, I'll first go through it like this, and then in the next period, I will hand out the calipers and I'll hand out the micrometers and we will sit and take measurements with these apparatus because these are things we don't normally work with. Okay, so people, um, the first thing when we measure length, Okay, measure length. What instrument do we use? Ruler. A ruler or a measuring tape. Okay, or cor <coughs> the correct word is actually a rule. R-U-L-E. We use a rule to measure. Yes. Next period you can bring it with. No, they won't mark it wrong. Okay, so what instrument do we use? A rule, a measuring tape, a veneer caliper, and here is the picture of the veneer caliper, and something called a micrometer screw gauge. I have a picture of one. Um, there's a micrometer screw gauge. All right, and today we are going to have a look at how to take the reading, so that in the next period when I hand them out, we will all try and see if we can take the readings. Okay, so... Back to the veneer caliper. The veneer caliper, people, is used especially in engineering workshops where they do fitting and turning and they have to, for example, get a specific diameter of a pipe or a specific thickness of metal. Okay? Um, a ruler is inaccurate and it's very difficult to add, put the ruler to measure the diameter of a tube. All right? A veneer caliper has got... Uh, this part over here, there, can slide along the shaft. So it opens up the jaws over here. So the stuff that I want to measure, I go and stick it into the jaw, I push it closed, and it gives me, I must take the reading over here. Um, a veneer caliper, it depends a little bit, you get more accurate ones, is up to one hundredth of a centimeter. All right? So in other words, 0 0.01 centimeter is the accuracy. Okay, yes. Your ruler only goes to millimeters, ne? A tenth. So, how does it work? We talk about, this is the jaws, the external jaws. Here we have something called the internal jaws. That is very simply... If I have an opening and I want to measure the outside, I have a pipe. Here's my pipe. Okay, I want to measure the outside. I will use the external jaws. It will go there. All right? But what about that? Sometimes I have a pipe with a hollow opening. I just want to... Uh, this is not going to work. Uh, let's take... Let's take this, yes. Okay, let's say I want to measure the diameter of this glass jar. So what do I do? I take my caliper and I use those jaws. I stick them in and I open it up. Alright, and it will measure from side to side. So we use the internal jaw to measure the inner diameter of a pipe and we will measure the external jaw to measure the outer length reading of whatever we want to measure. Do you understand? All right. We talk about, there's a locking screw, I'll explain that in a moment. We have a main shaft over here and we have the sliding or veneer scale over there. So when we take a reading, the first reading, we will read it off the main shaft, just like you would read a ruler. So for example, here's the main shaft there, okay? So we would read it off on the main shaft. That's the first reading. Then, the second reading, sometimes if I have, here's my main shaft, let's just say that, and there's my calibration, 
Alright? And here is the object that we are measuring. Alright. So my reading on my main shaft, well, I can take that one. Not so? I could read on that one. Not. Why not? It's not there. Okay? Can I read on that one? No. But we must start somewhere. So what we do is, we read on that one. Because that's closest to what I can measure on my main scale. But this extra little bit must also be measured. And that we measure on this veneer scale that slides. Okay. And there's a special way of doing it. Yes, that's the comma something of a millimeter. All right. Yes. Now the electronic one will probably be more accurate. All right. Remember this instrument? Um, it is also exposed. It's a metal sliding instrument. It expands, it contracts, room temperature varies, so there will be a bit of an error on it. Okay. The electronic one is not influenced by expansion and contraction. Okay. Yes. Yes, the outer one can shift. Okay. Yeah. This this whole thing is attached to that part. So if this opening must go more, this whole thing slides down. Okay. Now, here I have an enlargement. That is the main scale. All right. That is the one we read on the shaft, the instrument. So I will read there. Two, okay, so it starts zero, one, here we get two, how many millimeters? Two point? One. one. But can you see, now on this sliding scale, this, this part is on, is this part of the instrument, the stuff that can slide. Alright? Now, over here, we see it is also calibrated zero, five, ten. This breaks up a millimeter into Yes, well, two, ten parts in this case, on this one. Okay? So, my reading over, over here as well, it breaks it up into ten parts. Alright? So, tenths of a millimeter is a hundredth of a centimeter. Alright, now, the first reading we will take over there. But there is a little bit more. And we read that on the veneer scale. Can you see there's a zero marking? Can you see, it, it shows there's more, but how much more? Now, this thing works. If you go and look at those divisions, somewhere along the line, you just look, where does it correspond perfectly with the ones on the main scale and over there? So, my main scale reading over here is 2.1 centimeters. Are you with me on that? Okay. The veneer scale is... How many divisions are there? Ten. Okay. So one, two, three. So remember, that is the one hundredth. Okay. So it is the 0 0.03 of the centimeter. It's the extra bit more than what the millimeter division can read. So what is the reading? 2.13 centimeters. Did you follow? Okay, we will do this again and I will hand them out tomorrow. So let's have a look at the second example. That is, yes, that's that extra little bit. Okay, here I have another example. It's also an enlargement. This once again is the main scale. The bottom one, the shorter one, is the veneer scale, the one that can slide. All right, so we open our jaw and we close it onto a specific point and we read the first reading on the main scale. Can you see? Where's the zero? Well, it's 10 centimeters plus a little bit. Okay, so my first reading is 10 centimeters. What is the reading on the veneer scale? Well, we can look. Where do these little lines correspond with those on the main scale? Two. There. All right? So, remember that is the extra little bit. So, we have 10 plus 0 0.02. All right? No, there's 10, there's 11. 
So it's 10.1234567891. No, they just, they had, I've just not shown the whole thing. I've just cut out that piece where you need to take the reading. All right, so what is the full reading? That plus that is 10.02. Well, the error will lie on that reading. So it's more accurate than your ruler. Yes. Okay. Yes, it will be plus 0 0.005 up or down. Yeah. Are you with me? <laughs> Good. All right. Let's have a look at the third example. You know, I have another one. We have our main scale reading. All right. Well, we start reading at 3. And there's four now, ten divisions, so it's 3.123. Do you agree with me? 3.3. But there's a little bit extra. How much? Well, now we start looking. Where do they correspond? Are you with me? Okay, so we count. If that's zero and that is five, we have one, two, three, four. But remember, this is the 100th. So it is 0 0.04. So my total reading is 3.04. Do you follow? Ah, uh, 3.4, sorry. Are you okay? I will hand them out tomorrow. I just want you to have an idea. Otherwise, it's chaos if you don't know where to start. All right. But we will go through each one of you. Um, if you can give me a stick, I'll do it. Okay. All right. That is the veneer caliper. The other instrument that we must have a look at is something called a micrometer screw gauge. And a micrometer screw gauge, micrometer, 10 to the power minus 3 of a meter. Okay? Micrometer screw gauge is accurate to 100th of a millimeter. Yes. All right. Now, a micrometer, people, it looks exactly like this. It's got a funny little rounded part here, and it's got a part here at the back that can turn. Okay? Um, just let me quickly take one. I can just show you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Clever people. All right, people. Yeah, I have a micrometer screw gauge. Okay. You get bigger ones and you get smaller ones. All right. But they're very expensive. All right. So, the stuff I want to measure, can you see I'm turning on this part? Okay. This part can turn. This part the main scale part stands still. There's a shaft. Okay? And this part over here, the thimble part, that can turn. All right? So I have a set of readings there. And as I turn this part, the shaft becomes longer because the opening there becomes bigger. All right? The second part of my reading is on this thimble part, the part that rotates. All right. So, when we start taking a reading, there are a couple of things when we work with a micrometer screw gauge. Unfortunately, if I measure something and I'm much stronger than you, I can tighten it up harder. And I'm going to close it down a millimeter from somebody else. So, the first thing that they do or have on this instrument, yeah, right at the bottom, I have a ratchet. So, when I tighten it up, I close it up, and then at a certain amount, when there's a certain amount of force applied, it slips. It doesn't close it up anymore. All right, so I can't over-tighten it. All right, so that's the first thing. Now, when we take our readings, note, reading on the main scale. We start just like we did with a caliper. We need to take the first reading on the main scale. But where do we take it? Here on the edge of the thimble. All right? But now have a look at this main scale. Can you see zero? That would be one millimeter, two millimeters, three millimeters, etc. But can you see there's a little one down there on the bottom as well? 
that is half, one, one and a half, two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four. Okay, so this main scale reading is going to be four and a half. All right. And then we need to take the extra reading here on the thimble scale. All right, I'll show you now in a moment. Once again, here I've got an enlargement. All right, this part is the part that can turn. That part is the shaft. All right, so where do we take our reading? We start always with a main scale reading. What is the main scale reading? Well, in this case, can you see one? Two millimeters, but there is two and a half millimeters plus a little bit. So the main scale reading is two and a half. You're all with me. But now what is the little bit? The little bit we have to read on the symbol part that can rotate. All right? So now we go over here and we simply look where this middle line there corresponds with a calibration on the thimble. Yes. Yeah, well, there will be some accuracy. That is, there will be. Okay. No instrument is perfect or absolute. Okay. So, over here now, what is my reading? Well, remember, we go from 35 to 40. So, 35, how many divisions are there? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So, 35, so it's comma 2, 4, 6. All right. I think I've got it there on 8. There's a mistake. Uh, circular scale. Well, it's 35. Oh, sorry. Yes. I've made a mistake. Just have a look. 35 to 45 divisions. So each one represents one. So it's 35, 36, 37, 38. But 0 0.38 millimeters. The less. The little bit more than the half a millimeter. Nah. So, how do we get the answer? We add 2.5 plus 0 0.38 because that is the little bit extra. And our reading is 2.88. Okay. Here's another example. Where's my main scale? There. All right. The first reading is on the main scale. What do we get? 20, 21, 22. Can we see we've not got half? Okay, so my main scale reading is 22 millimeters, but now we've got a little bit more than 22 millimeters. How much more? We read that off the thimble scale, so we check where does it correspond over there. Well, it goes 30, 31, 32, 33, so it's 0 0.33. The reading 22.33. Yes, then it's zero. Yeah. The next one, just another example. Main scale reading, well, five, six, seven, and can you see a little bit extra? We've got the half. So the main scale reading, 7.5. But what's the little bit extra? Where do we find that? On the thimble. So we go 20. Oh, there it lies. Okay, so it is going to be 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, but it's 0 0.24 now. So there is our answer. We add them. Do you follow? Yeah. All right. Um, please look in your textbooks, exercise one, number one, two, and three. This is on page... Okay, it's just there on page 77 and 76. It's just an exercise in measuring. It's not, it's just choosing the correct answer. All right? But I want you to do it just sort of to get into the hang of it. Okay? And I will stop at this point. Okay?
Life is in constant motion. Everything and everyone is moving. And so is GoTV's unstoppable entertainment. When unlikely paths cross, love blossoms, even for the most vulnerable. To some, time has proven to be no factor. All that matters is surviving the trials and tribulations. When you act fast, you become invincible to many. We are groundbreaking shows. Go TV. Live it. Love it. ShopRite has always been here for you, and our promise to bring you low prices on what you need most will never change. Get an essential food hamper that includes Sugar King white sugar, Top Score instant porridge, Top Score maize meal, Rice King parboiled rice, Bakery brown or white bread, Right brand sunflower oil, Clover Numel dairy blend, Polana spaghetti, Romi low fat spread, and Imana regular soup. All 10 for just $110. Only at ShopRite. One stop, one safer shop. The Champions League season is reaching a new peak. Are you ready for the ride? Everything again. Europe's finest football clubs are about to experience unrivaled acceleration. And DSTV gives you the best seat in the house. It's the thrilling rush to the UEFA Champions League final. Get connected to DSTV to experience every heart-stopping moment. Measuring using calipers and micrometers. And yesterday in class, we had a look at the practical part of it. I handed them out. And at this point, then, you should be able to work with a micrometer and a caliper. All right. All right. Okay. So, now I want to carry on with time. And um, people, when we measure time... Here I have a picture of a stopwatch. Sometimes you can refer it to it as a stop clock or um, stopwatches then are very commonly used. Your cell phones all have a stopwatch for, uh, app on it. Okay. And um, the unit then when we work with time in science, the unit with which we measure time is the second. All right. The instrument. Is a stop clock or a stop watch? Now, very important, and not everybody understands that. When you use a stopwatch and you use human, well, humans to measure the time, you can be no more accurate than one tenth of a second. In actual fact, on that one-tenth of a second already will be an error. Because human capability is that you cannot be more accurate than one-tenth of a second. Yes, even if you train to do it, you cannot go faster than a tenth of a second. That's weird. All right, yes. Yes, well, electronic time is more accurate. In general, hand time is always... Electronic time is faster than hand time. Hand time is always slower. Yes. 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 When we have the uh, prestige athletics meeting where we have the senior athletes, then the Namibian Athletics Federation, they bring the mat with the electronic time. That is, yes, yes, that, that measures electronic time. Yeah. Yes, you, yes, there's human error on it. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. To get more or less what it should be. There is always human error. Um, what we do do, for example, when we take the first position, we have two or three stopwatches on first position. 
And then we compare them and we take the average of them. And sometimes you find that if they are usually still quite on it and they um, are experienced time takers, then you can sometimes find that they are perfectly get the same reading. Okay. Um, but it is not always like that. Okay. All right. So, people, when we work with hand time, one-tenth of a second is the maximum accuracy. So, if I had to read this stopwatch, I have one minute, 23 seconds, 0.25 seconds. Can you see that that five actually already is absurd? So, the correct reading would be one minute, 23 seconds, 0.25. Yeah. Two tenth of a second, the hundredth of a second. Because it's one hundredth of a second. That is one tenth of a second, and that is a hundredth of a second. Hand time cannot measure that. So even though your stopwatch indicates it, it's definitely not accurate. In athletics, yes, we use it. To differentiate, because when two athletes cross the finishing line, the one who puts, well, the first part of his body that goes over. So then sometimes we will say, okay, the one went 23.2 and the other one was 23.25 seconds or 24 seconds, just to differentiate, the, well, when we enter it for a first and a second position. Eh? But hand time, one-tenth of a second accurate. Now, in your books there on page 79 and 80, there are a couple of exercises, once again, measuring time. I'd like you to do them for homework, people. It's not a lot of work. It will take you three minutes. And uh, I want to carry on measuring volume. Okay, now measuring volume. What apparatus do we use to measure volume? Well, we have various apparatus. Here I have a picture of a so-called measuring cylinder. Now, measuring cylinders are usually either made from glass or plastic. The glass ones are just more expensive than the plastic ones. And they are calibrated in, well, millimeter or cubic centimeter. Okay? When I work with a measuring cylinder, let's say I wanted 20 cubic centimeters of water, then I will say if that is 20 cubic centimeters, I will fill it with water to the level. I will go down with my eye exactly on the level where I want to take the reading, and I take the reading below the meniscus. Okay? If I want to be a little bit more accurate, because a measuring cylinder can be out quite a bit. When I have a burette and a pipette, I can measure much more accurately. A burette is usually made from glass. I suppose you would get plastic ones as well. It's a long, thin tube. It's about as thick as this pen in my hand. Long tube, about that long. And it's got a tapered edge with a tap on it. It is calibrated over here is the zero reading and over there, for example, a 50 cubic centimeter reading. So when you work with a burette, you will fill it up to the zero mark, okay? And then you will tap off the liquid that you need. You open up the tap, the liquid runs out, the level will drop, okay? And you can take the reading there, oh, I've tapped out 25 centimeters cubed. And you know exactly what you've run out. The accuracy of a burette is one drop, Okay, and one drop is approximately 0 0.05 milliliters. Say again. Ugh, no, not really. It's just, it's accurate then to that level. Okay. Um, a pipette, people, we get different types of pipettes. Some pipettes are a glass tube that's got like a fat section to it. If you look carefully on them, you will see here at the top somewhere, they've got a little marking on it. So when you work with those pipettes, the pipette will be of a specific volume. So you can only measure that specific volume with a pipette. You will draw the liquid up the tube, up to the mark, and then we will tap it out into the container that we need. Okay. 
the Papet people, these ones over here, are calibrated for one specific volume. Okay? These pipettes over here, they are calibrated and you will once again draw up the liquid and then you can hold your finger on the end and the liquid will stay in and if you want to run out a little bit, you remove your finger and it can run out. Yes. Okay. Um, so when we measure volume, we can use a measuring cylinder, a burette or a pipette. All right. Yes. A pipette is probably more accurate even than a burette because it measures, if you use the one that measures the fixed volume. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But when you don't know what volume you need, then you will use a burette because you can control it drop for drop. And a drop is 0 0.05 of a milliliter, which is quite accurate. Eh? All right. So... <clears throat> Yeah, exactly like that. It's a big rubber thing that you squeeze on the bulb and it releases the air through a valve and you push on another valve and it draws up the liquid. Okay. Okay, volume of a regular shaped object. If you have a regular shaped object, you can measure the length of the sides. So if you have a cuboid to get the volume, it is simply length times breadth times height. Length times breadth times height, which in that case is 14 times 12 times 8, and it gives you 1,344 cubic centimeters. If we have a cylinder, the formula for the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared times height. No. Your calculators all have a key pi, so you use that one when you work out volume of a cylinder. If we have an irregularly shaped object, it's more difficult because I cannot measure the sides. So we have to make another plan. Okay. What we can do is one very simple method is to take that object and submerge it in water, because if you put it into water, the level of the water will rise, and the amount that it will rise will equal the volume of the object. So here yeah, I just have a diagram. I've got a toy dinosaur. I've got a measuring cylinder. I put in a specific amount of water into my measuring cylinder. For example, over here, I have got 4.8, let's say, cubic centimeters. Then I go and put the dinosaur into the liquid. The liquid level will rise. You take the new reading over there. We have 5.6. 6 is over there. So that is 8. That is 6. 5.6 cubic centimeters. So what is the volume of the dinosaur? Well, that one minus that one. So there, what is the volume of the toy? There we've worked it out. We can use a different instrument than the measuring cylinder, something known as a Eureka can. Now, a, a Eureka can is a, an odd-looking odd instrument because usually if something has a spout, the spout doesn't hang down, it stands up. But this one has a spout that hangs down. So what do you do? You simply go and fill this container with water until it starts running out. So the level of the water, in other words, would be just there below the outlet of the spout. Are you with me? All right. So now we can go and add the object into that container. The water level is going to rise, but it is going to be pushed out by the spout. So it will run out into a beaker. You can run it out into a measuring cylinder and you can measure the volume of the displaced liquid, which will give you the volume of the irregular shaped object. Yes. No, both of them have got various places where they can be inaccuracies. Sometimes in the both cases, if you add the object into the liquid, sometimes there are little air bubbles sticking to the surface. 
which are quite difficult to remove. Yes, when you start shaking it, you could splash out some of the water. All right. So when you do these experiments, you must be very careful. You must, well, careful. you can't really stick something in because then the water sticks onto that object and you've got less water. So you have to try and shake off the air bubbles or remove air bubbles. You must try not to splash out any of the liquid. Um, those are the points where you will have errors. Okay. Um, when you go from, I would, for example, put the measuring cylinder directly below the spout because if you first put it into one container and then into another container, there's another uh, opportunity of splashing out some liquid and making it even less accurate. Also, when you pour it out a little bit, always sticks onto the sides of the container. Okay, so it is not 100% accurate. Okay, so what is, how does it work? Eureka can is filled with water until the water runs out of the spout. The water level in the can will then lie just below the opening of the spout. When the object is placed into the can, the water will run out on the spout. You will catch it up in a measuring cylinder, and then the volume of the liquid displaced will equal the volume of the object that was placed in the can. No. The moment you splash out liquid, you are making your experiment inaccurate. Okay. Yeah. Yes. But the string is also a source of error because the string also has volume. One drop is also an error. Okay. People, what is the advantage of using measuring instruments? Well, we can quantify measurements. Different observations of different people can be compared more accurately if we can measure what we have observed. Accurate information can be shared or kept for future reference. For example, when we have uh, a javelin competition, there is a record which was the furthest distance thrown. And we measure our distances and we try and reach or go beyond the record. Okay. So we can share the information and we can keep it for future reference. What are the disadvantages of measuring instruments? Well, sometimes, yesterday you all saw, it's sometimes very difficult to use certain instruments. We need specialized training to be able to use them. If you give your ruler calibrated in millimeters and you go and ask a grade one to measure the length of their rubbers, will they get a decent answer? No. Probably not, because they haven't been trained to do it yet. Okay? If I gave you calipers and micrometers before we had done them in class and I said, yeah, okay, go and measure the thickness of your pen, would you be able to do it? No. Probably not, because you've not had the training. So. One disadvantage then of measuring instruments, well, you need some training. When we are at an athletics meeting, they, all the officials are ex told exactly how they should measure. Okay. They give them some training. If they don't have the training, you get some absurd results. Sensitive instruments can be damaged very easily. They drop, they fall, you knock them off a table, you splash water over them. Yes, and they are very often very expensive. Okay? Another problem is that measurements can be influenced by weather or temperature. For example, a measuring tape on a cold morning is definitely a little bit shorter than on a hot afternoon. All right, due to the expansion of the instrument. Okay? Accuracy of your measurement will always depend on the scale division of the instrument. No matter if you think you can, you cannot be more accurate than the instrument. Okay. So if your instrument is calibrated in millimeters, you cannot go and measure a thousandth of a millimeter with it. It's impossible because your instrument can't do it. Okay. Now, we are still busy with time. A pendulum is simply a string attached at one end to an object 
can be a round object, it can be a square object, it can be any shaped object, that's not important. Yes, well, that is a pendulum. They call it a metronome, but it is a type of a pendulum. Okay, so, yes, who has an old grandfather clock in their homes? On the bottom there's a pendulum that swings backwards and forwards. Okay, now, people, a pendulum, they say it's a string attached to pivot at one end, you can hold it up, fix it onto the ceiling, and we can enable the string to, I can lift up this object, I can let it go, and it is going to swing backwards and forwards. All right, well, if there was no friction, forever. We call this weight over here a bob. People, that bob can be triangular shaped, it can be round, it can be rectangular, it can be in the shape of a little flower, it doesn't matter. Okay, yes. No. No. I'll come back to that one now in a moment. Okay, now. People, to make it swing, we have to lift at one end, all right? So when we lift it, it gains a bit of gravitational potential energy. And then I let it go, and gravity makes it go faster and faster and faster, so the gravitational potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. So then it swings past that point, and now the kinetic energy is going to be converted into gravitational, gravitational potential energy. It's going to hang there for a split second, and then it's going to come back. Technically speaking, if there is no friction, that thing should keep going forever. But there is friction. Yes. Okay, if you have a very precise one. Um, bob is raised to one side, keeping the string taut, then released. The bob will now swing to and fro from the vertical equilibrium position. One swing is from one side, so from there down to the equilibrium position, up to the opposite side, and back again. That's one full cycle. Okay? So if I have a pendulum and it starts swinging from over here, there, it will go there and back again. One full cycle. All right. One swing is from side, one side down through the equilibrium position, up the opposite side, and back to the original starting point. We call one swing an oscillation, which is a big word for a vibration, or one cycle, or one vibration. To measure time. I'll explain to you in a moment. The time taken for one oscillation is called the period. Okay? So, if it takes three seconds to do that, the period of that oscillation is three seconds. All right. Now, what determines the period of the pendulum? Very important. Does the shape, the size of the bob, the mass of the bob determine the period of the pendulum? It does not. It gives it gravitational potential energy, but it does not. A heavier bob will not fall faster than a lighter one. Okay? Yes? What does influence the period of the pendulum? Okay? Just hang on. Okay? We saw that how does the length of the pendulum influence the time? If I have a longer pendulum, it goes slower. If I have a shorter pendulum, it goes much faster. So the length of the pendulum determines the period. It determines how long it is going to take. On the piano, the metronome. If you want to have a faster rhythm, what do you do with a little weight? Up or down? Up. Uh, faster. Yes. Yeah. Why? Because even though the pendulum stands like that, yeah, yeah, it's shorter. Yeah. If you want it to go slower, 
you push the weight upwards and it goes slower. Okay. Because the length of the pendulum determines the period of the pendulum. So over here, the length of the pendulum will determine the period. A pendulum that has a length of one meter, look how things fit in together, will have a period of two seconds. So it will go from here, one, two. No, the length will have a period of two seconds. The time taken to go from there to there and back again would be two seconds. So the time to go from there to there would be one second. All right. And that is why they use pendulums in the old time to keep time. The next question that fits on with this one, whether the pendulum falls from there to there to there, or whether it falls from there to there to there, the time is still going to be the same because the time is determined by the length of the pendulum. to hear from you. Send us your views, comments and videos with your name and town to the One Africa TV's WhatsApp on 81 200 or send an SMS to triple five. One Africa TV. It just gets better. Accommodation is the ability of the eye to focus on distant and near objects. And I bring it in contact with the electroscope. What you must keep in mind is positive charge can't move. It is the negative charge that moves. So the first one, EF, is then going to be 0 minus negative 2 over 4 minus negative 4. Look at my signs. If you go wrong there, if you don't substitute in brackets, you're definitely going to get wrong answers. Namibia is known for its beautiful wide open landscapes. However, these deserted spaces also pose numerous educational challenges in our country's rural areas. Because of this, many learners are denied access to proper teaching and learning. At Eduvision, we believe that education is the starting point to a journey of endless possibilities. The plan for Edgevision was to identify areas in Namibia that do not have the proper learning resources, a working school or an education center. My name is Philip Smith. I'm the principal of Educate Academy in Ochivarongu. The project EduVision, the e-learning program, started in 2017. With a project like this, obviously, um, telecommunication, internet connection is, is a major uh, thing that needs to be sorted out, a logistical challenge. 
and the fact that we chose Chunque Secondary School as the first school didn't make it easier for ourselves. It's very far from Ochivarongo, it's far from Buntuk. So the internet connection was, was a big challenge first of all. So with the help of the telecommunications expert Paratus, uh, they made this dream come true uh, with internet connections um, via Buntuk, Ochivarongo to Chunque and then back the whole process. Like I said, it's interactive whiteboard, so uh, the internet speed, uh, capacity of the connectivity and so forth plays a major role. And um, so Paratus made this dream come true and they were on board from the first moment. Uh, and uh, so we're grateful for Paratus. project offers teaching assistance of a high standard in science to rural secondary schools within the learners' own community by means of e-learning. This entails the following. Live transmissions of lessons from an equipped teacher in a different location to the students in rural areas. Students using their own cell phone, tablet or computer to recall each lesson. And interactive lessons as well as the use of a smart board as a teaching aid. So if you look ahead at the next three years, um, we get uh, information from the Ministry of Education. The future is very bright, um, so I think there's, there's a lot of schools who can benefit from this program. Um, like I mentioned before, finances obviously is, is, plays a major role in a project like this. Um, so we're very thankful for all the sponsors that are on board and still on board after two, almost three years of the project. So as long as, as people from the private sector can get involved, I think we can reach many schools in, in Namibia um, because this project made a good start now. Um, we've already seen some positive results and uh, we can just call on all um, prior, the private sector corporate sponsors to come on board and join in this very, very positive project. It is Eduvision's goal to prepare and guide learners in order to make the modern world they are living in accessible to all. My name is Magdalena Neoma. I'm 18 years old and I'm doing my first year at uh, Unam Komansto campus. And I completed my grade 12 at Tsungkwe Senior Secondary School. I'm doing education, so I'm going to teach at Tsungkwe Secondary School because there I really need to go there and motivate the learners. Education helped me a lot. It assisted us uh, in teaching for mathematics, physical science, and biology. And it also we get to exchange learning from other schools like Educate, whereby they teach us, and that, that's the most uh, thing that we benefited from. Studying without Edivision was so challenging. And when Edivision was introduced at our school, things become more easier. The time where Edivision was not introduced, we were so slow in learning. And when education uh, introduced at our school, my learning speed increases. Things were, uh, things were kind of boring. And when education came, my mind uh, changed the way I think. I'm really grateful for what education uh, did, gave us. Our class of 2019 was the first group to make it uh, like to perform very well at Tsongkhwa Senior Secondary School. So it should keep up the spirit. We need that 
You should continue to support us. Edgevision aspires to ensure that equal opportunity is offered to every learner in rural areas to tap into his or her own potential while working in an environment which views disadvantages not as obstacles but as unique attributes that can be regarded as powerful assets when given the proper opportunity. At Edgevision, we believe that dreams are the foundation of knowledge and hope always triumphs over experience. No Share with us on hashtag learn on one. Tell us what you're learning and where you're learning it from. Send us your name and town to the One Africa TV's WhatsApp on 081-200-6659 or send an SMS to triple five. One Africa TV, it just gets better. On the gold coast of West Africa lies the peaceful and diverse nation of Ghana. I'm pretty close right now to the geographical center of the earth. It is also one of the last pockets for elephants in the wilds of West Africa. You know, every country in the world just about has cattle, sheep, goats, horses, donkeys. But it's only Africa that has the real megafauna, the charismatic stuff which people in the rest of the world want to see. The passion that the staff have for the job. There's value to a bird which brings birders to a place like this. I mean, this is a birding paradise. We see an intrinsic uh, appreciation and joy from seeing the wildlife out here, but not everybody does. You can't get to Moli and then uh, will not be passionate about what we do, because you'll be the only one left. Everybody is passionate. The only worthwhile war, the war against destruction, the war against loss, the war for peace, for balance, for inclusion. It is out of my way, buffaloes, elephants, tigers, are still in existence. If Mule fails, then Ghana is without wildlife. Join me as we journey to the untamed wilderness of northern Ghana to meet these last defenders. The people within the law enforcement agencies don't really know you're talking about a roan antelope. Somebody thinks it's just like a goat. When you're saying things that degrade women, for me, number one, I am not there because that is basically what I don't. I don't believe and I don't stand for things that degrade women. What do you think we can add? What do we? What can we put in the basket? Ah, uh, first of all, let's put blossom back in the basket. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the person like it, man. Let's do a song. Let's do something. Just let's like collaborate. Let's let's collaborate. Yeah. Africans were claiming us. Yes, exactly. Years. To the rest of the world, they belong to us. <laughs> Namibia, Baba, Namibia. I'll help you carry on. Creating music and, and putting some stuff out for the people who've been supporting me, that's definitely something that, that's next on my list.